Welcome to the Cabrera Lab podcast. Hey. What is up? <laughs> You're like, uh, a lot of things are up. Yeah. All right, listen, I have something that we want. I, I really think we need to do today. Oh. And it's interesting. That sounds serious. No, no, it's not serious. I just, you know, we, we've done um, a full episode on each of the patterns, distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives. Yes. And we even posted them in that order, distinction, systems, relationships, and perspectives. Yes. And the theory is DSRP. Yes. And mm -hmm. one of the things I think would be good to do on the heels of those episodes is answer the question we get in person all the time, which mm -hmm. is, do I need to do these things in order? No. In other words, are they steps, right? No. Do I first make distinctions, then no. systems? No. Okay. So I think we should we should clear yes, that up. That is a that is a big misconception. Probably because of my own doing that tw 30 years ago when I named the theory, I I just gave it the name of its acronym uh DSRP um and and didn't really think about that people would take that as a stepwise order. Mm -hmm. Number one, and then the other problem that that it, that arises from naming it that way is that um, people think of D and S and R and P as buckets that that you can kind of like categorize things in, and that both of those things are not the case. Okay, so let's slow down. Let's start with buckets. Sure. So let's make the analogy to you imagine there's a kid organizing all of the toys in their room. Yeah. And they're putting all of the dinosaurs in a bucket and all of the cars in a bucket, and right? Yes. Well, if people are doing that with distinctions and systems and relationships and perspective, I mean, they're putting things in a, oh, that's a distinction, that's a perspective. Yes. It seems to me the problem down the road is they don't, they won't remember when they're looking for something, how they, the, the way that they sorted them in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I guess we got to, unpack the problem down the road uh, yeah. i mean because there's just so many problems down the road and and you don't even have to go down the road to have problems you yeah, just have problems right beginning. right away <laughs> as soon as you start doing that i mean uh, you know a big part of concept formation is the the theory of categorization which yes. is creating categories or that concepts form because they exist in these categories and the problem with categories is actually I mean, there's some really deeply problematic issues with the, the notion of categories. Yes. But but the best way for people to understand it is just think about your folder system, right? When you put a file in a folder, you're in a particular mindset. Yeah. And that file goes in that folder because of that mindset. But then a week later... Mm -hmm you're in a different mindset and you're trying to find that file and you're not in the same mindset you were in when you stored that file, right? Uh -huh. And so inevitably we all end up with oodles and oodles of folders <laughs> that- We have no idea. Yeah, I have no idea where, which folder, what I would have named it, you know, that type of thing. So categories is kind of the cognitive equivalent of folders. Yes. And they don't work. Right. And the other problem is that we think categories are these static things, and there's nothing static about our thinking. Our thinking is very dynamic, right? Uh -huh. Meaning, like the old saying, you never step into the same river twice, right? Yeah. The, things have changed. The river has changed, right? Uh -huh. The flow of the water, the flow of thinking has changed. And so this idea of categories is super hyper problematic in, in that we we think that a lot of the concepts are formed because of these categories and the truth is these categories are constantly changing and the way they're changing is they're changing based on perspective so yes. if you think about ds and r and p the s systems is about part whole structure well part whole structure is how things group right and we could think of a category as a grouping, but a category is not synonymous with a grouping. A category is actually a grouping from a perspective, right? Right. And the problem is the perspective changes and we can't remember the grouping. Yes. Right? Yes. And so if we see categories as these discrete things that are discrete 
discreetly holding things. So they're not only discrete things, a category never changes, but they're also discreetly holding things. That is the beginning of the end of dynamical adaptive thinker. The beginning of the end. Yeah. That sounds not good. <laughs> yeah. So it, it is the fastest way to be yeah. a very static thinker. Yes. Um, and so understanding that we group things all the time. We're constantly grouping things. Mm -hmm. Just making a grocery list to go to your local grocery store is a part whole function, a part yeah. whole grouping. But we're grouping things from perspectives, and those perspectives are very subtle, very changing, very dynamical. Very, they're changing constantly. Mm -hmm. And um, oftentimes, we have no idea that we're even doing it. We don't even know we're grouping something. We don't even know why we're grouping it that way, but yeah. we're grouping it that way. So oftentimes, the perspective is um, hidden to us. It's subconscious. Well, a great example is I can make a grocery list, and you can make a grocery mm -hmm. list. And because I know the grocery store a little bit, I could make my grocery list from the perspective of the order of the aisles. Totally. And I know you, you're going to make it meat, dairy, <laughs> vegetables, <laughs> right? Bigger cat. And so I can hand you my list. Right. And you would be totally lost. And you could hand me yours. And I would have to sort of do that mental acrobat, acrobatics, right. not mental acrobat, um, to understand, overlay mine over yours, your categories. That's right. Which would be That's interesting. Right. Yeah. Well, what's interesting to me about this is um, it seems like a pretty surface level question. Why can't we just put DSRP in buckets or why isn't it a linear process? Mm -hmm. But the truth is it's actually a pretty deep question because it, it, it stands in the face of the true dynamics of DSRNP. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about maybe linear steps. You don't want to DSRNP one, two, three, four. We do that for teaching purposes a lot. Yeah, so again, let's uh, uh, we should probably down. slow it down a little bit because um, the fact that people want to stepwise DSRP and the fact that they want to bucket DSRP is kind of part and parcel, meaning part and parcel is, is part whole, like yeah. the whole and the part problem. Mm -hmm. It's the problem at the part level and it's the problem at the whole level. That's yeah. what the term part parcel means. Yeah. It's part and parcel of all that is wrong with our expertise on thinking. Say more. The modern, you know, what 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 experts in thinking do is they create these stepwise processes that are categorize categorizable, mm -hmm. and um, and that's just not the way the brain works. The brain is hyper dynamic. Right. And and it's changing constantly, like a, like the flow of a river, you know, or something like that. And and um, and so when people want to stepwise DSRP, when people want to bucket DSRP, it's because we've been so influenced by these these kind of archaic theories of how the mind works, and we're imposing that on DSRP. Yeah. And so then you take this dynamical theory that actually mimics the way the brain works and you turn it into this bucketed yeah. stepwise theory. Now, huge caveat, pedagogically, which just means teaching, mm -hmm. uh, or andragogically, which just means teaching adults, pedagogically technically means teaching children, but, mm -hmm. but teaching, for teaching purposes, I am totally okay with creating stepwise processes. Yeah, as training. As law as a training, yeah. right? As long as people understand that once you once you use that stepwise process to kind of learn what's going on, you don't make the assumption that that's how it's happening, right? It's it's a it's purely for teaching and learning purposes. Sometimes, oftentimes people need you to put it in steps. Like mm -hmm. first you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this. And the problem becomes that in the learning process, because you do it in steps, you think that it's done in steps. Well, we're biased because of the way we've been educated <laughs> right. to think things happen in a linear process that's Absolutely. nice and neat and that there's no um, fuzziness between step one and step two. There's no overlap. Uh, you think about all of the pyramids in our life, you know, yes. all of the food pyramid and yes. Bloom's taxonomy and how there are these sort of, in my opinion, seemingly arbitrary 
distinctions between among things that are sometimes happening in parallel or very connected. Yeah, never, never trust a pyramid in science. Never trust a pyramid unless you're in Egypt, basically. You know, uh, <laughs> don't trust pyramids as scientific because almost all the pyramids that science has uh, produced have turned out to be wrong. I feel like we should have a reel of podcast shows. <laughs> don't trust a pyramid if you're not in Egypt. Right. I think it's important to maybe give examples of why we shouldn't what what it looks like when we falsely linearize or bucket things, you know, like what what does that actually? Yeah, mean? I mean the, the simple Practice. the simple thing is if you if you if you bucket DSRP, uh, you know, you take your four little buckets and then you have, and, and what people do is they say, oh, I just said, uh, you know, I just thought of, um, you know, like a like a you mean like a verb like a connection or do you mean yeah a like thing? human resources. Yeah. Right. I just thought of human resources as a concept, right? Yeah. Or engineering, or you know, I'm thinking about my business, or I just thought of like you know this problem that I'm having in my family, or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And you go, okay, problem. That's uh, a problem is a distinction. So put it in the distinction box, right? right? Human resources is a is a system. Right. So I put it in the systems box, right? right? Well, sort of. But not really, because human resources is an identity that's part of distinction. You have to know what human resources is and isn't. Where where does the boundary of human resources begin and end? What mm -hmm. does it have jurisdiction over and not and all that kind of stuff? Human resources is an is an action because it exists. It acts. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. it, and as a result of it acting, other things react to it. So it's in relationship to other things. Mm -hmm. And it is a relationship between other things. So human resources could be in there. Could human there. resources has a unique perspective on the world. It does. Right? So it's obviously in, in that box. So we start to see that, oh, DSRP isn't saying that each thing has its place. DSRP is saying these are the patterns and the dynamical things that happen in order for concepts, mental models to form. Right. This is how we form concepts or mental models, ideas, yep. beliefs, mindsets, you, mm -hmm. you name it. All of those things uh, are mental models. So this is how we build mental models. This is the, the, the elements of how mental models are built in the same yes. way that A, T, C, and G are the elements that come together, the, the sort of uh, nucleotides that come together to form DNA and DNA mm -hmm. leads to, you know, all this remarkable biodiversity. So the diversity of thought that we have is predicated on the dynamics and structures of DSRP. It's not for buckets. The reason buckets as a concept is interesting to me is because it stands in direct opposition to the idea of how DSRMP actually exists in the real world. Mm -hmm. And so for, for me, like let's say this is a rabbit. Mm -hmm. And you ask me, which of those which of these things is this rabbit? Mm -hmm. Well, you could make the case that a rabbit is a distinction. Yes, it's an identity. It's, it's also an other it's to an other a, a bunch squirrel of stuff. or an elk or something. It's also a system yeah. made it's of a, parts. Made up of parts. It's also part of a larger whole, which is the hutch or yeah. you know, whatever. Or it could be part of dinner. You know, it could be part of... <gasps> no. Rabbits are delicious. Don't do it. It could be part of pets. It could be part of a lot of different things. Rabbit, the construct rabbit could be part of a lot of different things. And it and it, it has parts, meaning it's a whole. Yes. And, it, and you could look at rabbit and its parts from different perspectives and end up with a different list of parts. That's right. right? That's right. And a rabbit can sit in the relationship Absolutely. bucket with it, all It acts and attention. reacts to things. Yeah. Absolutely. And it can be the relationship between things. Yes, like for for you a rabbit is a relationship between hunger and dinner maybe. Yes, but to somebody for else a rabbit is, you know, know. their enjoyment because yeah. they're cute and fuzzy and Sorry. And then obviously we can take a pers a, a, rab a rabbit can be the point or the view yeah. of a perspective. Absolutely. But what's what's important to me is 
if I if I think of DSRP as buckets and I have any idea, we'll use we used rabbit, and I decide that rabbit is in only one of these, that I'm completely missing the rich dynamics of DSRP. Absolutely. And I'm not seeing the full picture. I don't have that fluidity with my thinking that everything that I'm thinking about is all four of these things. Yes. Right. And probably our our listeners don't care about the academic infighting or scientific infighting that happens. But I will say that that if there is a criticism of DSRP, it almost always uses the buckets straw man, right? Because it treats DSRP like a straw man. Hmm. You know, the concept this. Uh, so a, str a straw man is is like if you have an argument, it's in used a lot in rhetoric and debate, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're saying something that's reasonable and interesting and complex and robust and Which I do all, all that time. kind of thing, and if I reduce it to some simplified, mm -hmm. uh, you know, version of what you're saying, and yeah. then I can beat it up because of the because I've simplified it. Yeah. it so much and made it so effectively silly, almost, even though your argument is very good and sort of nuanced argument, but I, I could sort of turn it into this silly thing. Yeah. We call that a straw man argument. Right. Because I'm turning your good, nuanced, complex, thoughtful argument into a straw man, not a real man, not a real man argument. Yeah. It's not a real man argument. I'm not taking the real man of your of your You're argument. making a false. I'm making a false yeah. and man out of straw. As a distraction from the real. So argument. that I can beat it up. And yeah. then once I've beaten up the straw man, I go, see, your argument is crap. Right. And and well, not really. You beat up a you beat up a straw version of my argument, right? Yeah. So oftentimes when in the in the systems thinking world and things like that, if somebody wants to attack DSRP, what they do is they create a straw man of it. And they go, Well, blah blah blah. We already knew this. Or blah blah blah. It's not, blah, blah. And what they're doing is uh, You're not they making do it, any they friends do that today. voice, you know. <laughs> and what they're doing is they're saying, well, it's this stepwise thing that uh, that has these uh, you know buckets. <laughs> So you're like, okay, well, that's your straw man of what DSRP actually says as a theory. What's the advantage to that, to, for them? They get to stay in the, it's like old, the, the old timers do it. Uh, because it's hard to believe that there are these, these, such a set of dynamics to this theory that. Well, Kuhn, Kuhn said in Scientific Revolutions, he, he, Kuhn was one of the guys that, you know, developed, uh, the notion of a paradigm before paradigm was an obnoxious word, but uh, and and Kuhn talked about a lot of times paradigms don't shift because you know everybody just catches up with this new thinking, the new science. Yeah. A lot of times paradigms shift because the old guys die, and the new guys they you bring know, the new bring stuff. the new ideas, right? But then they become the old guys. Eventually. And then they become the old guys yeah, and they and, and as you become the old guy, you need to protect your realm, yeah. right? So that yeah, yeah. the old guys are always protecting the realm and the new guys are always innovating on the realm and mm -hmm. you know, so in science 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 is science, but academia is a is a political, you know, people m make this mistake a lot. They think academia is science. Right. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Academia is a game played by academicians, and it's every bit as political. That's a and fancy word. Absurd. Academicians. What's the fancy? Oh, sorry. Acad no, academics. No, I know, but you said it very. It was fancy. Yeah. So it's every bit as sort of political and you know human and uh, as any other world, business or politics or you know anything. Yeah. And that's very different than science. Science is is a is a is a beautiful, wonderful thing that shouldn't be confused with academia. It is. It is. It's not petty. I was thinking back to when I was first exposed to this theory and the ideas, and I remember very specifically there were moments when I was trying to really understand it and apply it, where I would be in a conversation, for example, or I'd be starting a project at work. And I would remind myself to look at it from what are the distinctions I'm making? Am I organizing this the right way? Are there mm -hmm. relationships I'm missing? 
And, you know, are there different things I haven't considered when I'm looking at this? So I don't want people to think that that's not a useful process. That linear kind of interrogation as sort of an, a, um, a way to remember when you're starting to really learn to see these things totally. is very useful. 100%. Like really useful. Because I would say, you know, probably nine times out of 10 when I would do that, I'd be like, oh, I'm making a relationship between this and that, and the person I'm talking to is not. So then I could slow down the conversation and say, oh, hold on, Bob. You know, you're, you're, I understand now you're thinking this and this are connected, and I was talking about this and this, or it's mm -hmm. a distinction error. So I don't want people to get the impression that that's not useful. Yeah. So I want people to realize that that's a really useful process to, to bringing that, that unconscious stuff to your conscious to be conscious of it, right? That, oh, I'm making distinctions. I'm, I want to question these things along the way. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm relatively new to jujitsu, right? And um, uh, later in life, you know, and, um, you know, I'm, and I love trying new things because it teaches, you know, I'm, I'm a, an expert in one domain, but I'm, you know, totally new in this other domain, yeah. right? And, boy, do I need it, like, laid out for me. You know, like, tell me what to do now. <laughs> right? Like, okay, now that I've done yeah. this move, what now what do I do? And, okay, now that I've done this move, now what do I do? But I know that if you're talking about, you know, some remarkable jujitsu master like Gordon Ryan or, you know, somebody like that, they're, they're doing it in this yeah. wildly dynamical way. Right. They're they're not doing it in a stepwise way because because the nature of a match is dynamical. Right. So they're mm -hmm. doing they're blending offense and defense, you know, which used to be separate categories, separate buckets, yes. offense and when defense, you're learning it. Right. When yeah. you're learning it, this is an offensive move. This is a defensive move. They're they're blending offense and defense. They're they're trying to trick people to think that they're in a defensive posture and then bring them into an offensive posture, right? And they're blending moves and they're they're combining moves and it's dynamical. So, but when you're learning, you're, you know, you're overwhelmed by the dynamics. So again, if you're doing buckets and stepwise because it's helping you learn it, do it all day. Fantastic. Do it all day. Yeah. It's fantastic. And D and S and R and P will help you remember, oh, have I, have I done the systems part whole? Have I done the perspective? Have I done the... That'll help you get good at it. But as you get good at it, you will start to see a world open up where you're like, oh my God, the, you know, when I take a different perspective, mm -hmm. all the distinctions that I just made change. Yeah. I just worked on all these distinctions and I take a different perspective and they all change. Oh my goodness, that happens with the relationships too. They all change. And that happens with the part whole structure. They, they, it organizes itself differently. And actually the difference between the thought I had five minutes ago and the thought I'm having now is because of that perspective shift. So now I can actually compare and contrast, which is the relationship, this perspective to that perspective. Yeah. And I can see, oh, oh, and what would happen if I blended the perspective? That's part whole. I'm taking two perspectives and grouping them. And now I'm taking a, 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 a blended perspective. We were talking about this last night with uh, Carter was doing his homework and yep. the Federalist Papers, yeah. right? One of the most important documents written in our in our Constitution, and it and it was the blending of two otherwise polarized perspectives: the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, right? Yeah. And what we ended up with was a Constitution with a Bill of Rights. Yeah. Because of these two perspectives getting blend, getting grouped, part whole grouped, mm -hmm. and and coming out with the result of what they saw when they grouped, yeah, right, which we call you know a compromise or what you know we call it by a lot of different names, but that remarkable dynamics that leads to something like our Constitution and the Bill of Rights coming together, I mean, you know, it's kind of kind of remarkable. It is remarkable. And you know, I love I love the the jujitsu analogy because there'll be a moment for you when you're in a 
I guess you call a spar. Is it a spar? Rolling or whatever. When yeah. you're rolling, yeah. there'll be a moment where I I get this a sense. Match. Well, whenever you're in a match yeah. or whatever the hell, match. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> match. But there'll be a moment where that sort of kind of awkward, sloppy, conscious reminding yourself in the moment will disappear. Totally. And it'll just become like you'll intuitively have burned that sort of memory and you'll Absolutely. know how to respond in the moment to different Absolutely. moves. And I yeah. think that's a great analogy to what happens you know, with with metacognition and DSRP is there's a moment where no matter what you're doing and like I'm talking to you in a conversation and I don't have to remind myself to think about those right. things because it's sort of happening naturally and I catch them really quickly. Well, it, and that's I'd like to that's bur that's why practice is so important yeah. in jujitsu, in basketball, in thinking. If you practice the moves, if you practice these these things that we've been showing folks, you know, literally within weeks, you're going to see a complete difference in the way you approach the world and see the world. But pretty soon you won't have to um, you won't have to think about it because it'll just come naturally. You burn the neurons and your brain takes that path that you burned because it's been burned yeah. enough times that, oh, it's a path now. It used to be a jungle. Mm hmm. It used to be a jungle that you were hitting through with machete and it was hard work every time, right? But then it becomes a path and then you're just cruising the path. And the more you cruise the path, the more the path is crucible. Yeah. It, it really comes down to the practice. So again, stepwise, fine. Buckets, fine. If it's for learning. Well, and knowing that that's not how the patterns actually exist. Yeah, exactly. In, real, in the real world. Exactly. We can linearize them and we can categorize them as a way to understand them and apply them. Yes. To sort of build that muscle memory. But the truth is, in the real world, they're all happening all the time. All the time. Um, mm -hmm. Around anything that you're thinking about. Yeah. And because um, I remember, gosh, it was a long time ago now. There, I think you're right. It was probably a few weeks where I was sort of really reminding myself in every like in every conversation I was having at work and then mm -hmm. also at home. And then I also remember every time I was trying to sort of get something started, whether it was a personal project or a work project, I remember saying to myself, have I paid attention to the distinctions I'm making? Have I thought about how I'm organizing the parts of this thing? I remember, I really, rem I have a very vivid memory of that being something I did very consciously for a, a little while, and then it sort of clicks, which I guess means it can happen for anybody. And yes. some people probably would be faster than me and might take a little longer than me. Who knows? I mean, I would also say that, you know, this is the way your brain thinks. This is the way your brain is working at the subconscious level. So the more you do this, the more you're going to see of that subconscious stuff that you're doing that's affecting your whole life, your behaviors, your moods, your emotions, your decisions, yeah. the predictions that you're making as you walk through your day. And to some extent, our society and our, and our um, especially our school systems, unfortunately, kind of train us out of this natural form of thinking, this form of thinking that you get from nature, from being in nature and things like that, and from being part of nature. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, I think that's why our, why the research shows that, you know, getting out in nature is so critical because it connects you with this kind of thinking, which is the most natural kind of thinking. It's the kind of thinking you were born into. Yeah. But then we get trained out of it. So once you start practicing, you're going to get trained back into it and it's going to feel so natural once you start practicing. Then, then you, you'll be like, "Oh my God, this this feels right. You know, this feels like like mm -hmm. the way it should be." That's right. And I've been missing this for all these years because I, you know, started caring about what the right answer was in school and 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 like thinking in these tunnels, these linear tunnels, yeah. to get the right answer, or yeah. get the the cookie. Well, and and also because the Scooby snack, the Scooby snack. Well, those are for dogs, but yes. Yeah, like go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a seal. <laughs> Scooby's a dog. It's all snacks. <laughs> to get the... All snacks all the way down. <laughs> Everybody wants a Russell snack said. of some sort. <laughs> well, the only thing I wanted to think about a little bit is when, we, when we've when we been out and about and we talk about this, there are three things. We say 
um, don't be the bucket guy. Right? Yeah. Don't don't believe that it's a forced linear process. And then also we talk about don't be the dic- don't just follow the dictionary terms. Right? Oh yeah. So that happens the most in in perspective and systems. And sy- well, yeah. I guess it happens all in all of them. them. Yeah. Yeah. So we that's a good point. Don't be dictionary guy. Don't be bucket guy. Don't be list uh, stepwise guy. So dictionary guy is is thinking again. Probably my fault. Because when I named the theory, I just came up with names. The names are really not what's super important. What's important is the underlying structure and dynamics of the theory. Um, but uh, I named it distinctions. I think distinctions is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, because it distinct you're distinguishing between things, right? It's a boundary between what is and what is not the thing. Yeah. Systems, I named it systems, is part whole. It's about how part and whole interact with each other, right? Yeah. And that's a fundamental cognitive pattern, as is identity, other distinctions, right? But some people think of systems as being like the dictionary definition of systems, and that's not what it is. It's it the, the definition of systems is literally how are part and whole interacting in your thinking, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. The holes contain parts and parts make up holes, right? right? But people think of systems. Well, what's what's funny is they think of the dictionary definition or they just think of their own definition. Like people have so many different definitions for systems. So systems is kind of a, you you could really call this organizing. Yeah. You know, grouping, sorting. How do we, because grouping you can group things in a million different ways. Yeah, that's exactly what systems is saying. Sorting, you can sort things in a million different ways. That's exactly what part whole systems is all about, is how are we sorting things? How are we grouping things? Yeah, but I think if you named it that, we'd get into the mess of categories. Right, uh, exactly. And and a category is like a group that has a little extra. Mm-hmm. It's got this perspective out there, right? So I think we should and, stick with part whole systems yeah. on that one. <laughs> Relationships, I think, is pretty pretty tight. You know, connections is another term you might think of, but relationships is is what it means, and it's it's about action reaction. It's about like yeah. if you if you just imagine two people on a on a on ice skates, yeah. and you push against, you have a an action and a reaction. Yeah. Both are gonna go backwards yeah. from one interacting because they're both acting on each other and they're both reacting yeah. to each other. So, and then perspectives, again, a lot of people think of this term to be, you know, things with eyeballs. It tends yeah. to be very visual. And we're not really saying that per se. We're, we're saying, like, how are things framed, mm-hmm. right? We're framing something. And, and the frame changes, you know, changes you the view, it changes yeah. what you see. Yeah. Just like in a photographer, you know, when you do that thing, you know, like photographer, right. or like a video, uh, like a cinematographer, cinematographer. the director is yeah. doing this thing. It's it's what's in the frame. Oh, well, there's a bunch of other stuff happening over here, but I'm just getting this in the frame. I mean, that's half the magic of movies, right? Is like there's a ton of other crazy stuff going on on yeah. set, but the frame makes it look like yeah. this is going on, right? Yeah. When I think about the dictionary thing, I think it's necessary to go to the next level. Mm-hmm. Identity, other distinctions, part, whole, whole system. Systems. To me, that's what... Action, it, reaction, relationships, yeah, and point view, view perspective. Point view perspective. Because if you don't, you can fall prey to thinking, oh, perspective is just what I see. Yes. Or you, you, sort of the, the, the uh, what's the word? Everyday version of what people right. think of when they think of the word. I don't even know what it says in the dictionary for perspective, but I think most people think, "Oh, it's what I see." Yes. So we want to we want to encourage people to just go one level down and see the two elements because that's what makes it different. The elements are where the thinking yeah. is happening. Yeah, the, yeah. the the D and S and R and P are just kind of labels that are uh, oftentimes um, you know get in the way of understanding the S R P. Ironically. Well, we couldn't name it I O. P W A R P V. That would be, be hard to say. <laughs> People would be like, "Who is this guy?" Yeah, this eight-lettered acronym. <laughs> It'd be like uh, Welsh. It'd be like oh, a Welsh yeah. word or something like that. You know, That's with like right. all the consonants. And... Yeah, remember on Wrexham? 
where they were they would have to literally they'd say it and yeah. then they'd spell it and even though they'd spell it you still couldn't yeah. understand it because yeah. it's all consonants really acronym. okay so we we've said we don't want to be dictionary we don't want to be bucket guy and we don't want to be linear girl yeah and, and unless you're doing it for learning for learning purposes to to get started then you know do whatever you need to do to get started but know that this is a wildly dynamical theory mm -hmm. um and by theory, I mean, you know, empirically supported true truism about uh, yeah. about reality. And, um, you know, we just don't want you to miss that dynamicism because that's the power. That's what makes that's why when you practice DSRP, you become more of an adaptive thinker. You're yeah. able to adapt to any situation. You become truly an, an adaptive thinker. Um, which which involves creativity and speed and you know uh, anal analytical ability, synthetic ability, critical thinking. You know all these types of uh, thinking that we value so much. This adaptive thinking is what is going to allow for all that. Yeah. And so, if you kind of miss the adaptive part because you bucketed it, dictionaried it, or less you know stepwise ordered it, yeah, then you're not really getting the benefit of it. The adaptive part comes from I'm in a conversation or a situation, and at that moment, I'm simultaneously sort of thinking about all of it at once totally. without knowing that I'm thinking. So I'm like listening, and I'm like, oh, that guy uh, is <laughs> seeing a relationship between this and that, and this person is making totally. a distinction error. And, I, and it's, so it's like it happens really quickly. Totally. And it's, um, it's that sort of simultaneity, and there's sort of this fractal nature of things, you know, that yeah, I mean, I, another example that might help people is, you know, when I first started yoga, I mean, I was just like, okay, I got to just tell me a posture, tell me one posture yeah. and like, tell me the steps to doing it. And, you know, and it was like, wow, this feels totally different and overwhelming. <laughs> and, you know, how am I ever going to understand this posture or whatever? And... And then you're like, okay, I got I got a collection of ten postures, and I do them in order every day, you know. And yeah. I do I always do them the same way every day, all ten, right? Yeah. And then pretty soon you're like, oh, actually, this is like I want to make this more dynamical. I want to incorporate movement into my posture, and so I'm doing more dynamical things. And then you're like, oh, I actually want to be super checking into my uh, breathing and also yeah. what my body feels like while I'm doing this. Like, yeah. oh, is it tight here? Is it, do I need to do more there? Or, do, or maybe I'm going to take a little diversion mm -hmm. because I feel something in my hamstring or wh whatever. And you, so you divert that day's practice to, to something that you're feeling. Yeah. In your body. Yeah. Right. And you end up and, and so you're now dynamically combining a bunch of things to create something that's very adaptive, mm -hmm. very aware. And you and you're doing what it what you're what you should be doing, which is really deeply checking in for me, at least. That's yeah. what my yoga practice is, is, is checking in with like. Where is my body at? Where does it hurt? Where does it not hurt? Where yeah. where do I need? Where am I lifting in strange ways yeah. that are causing imbalances, and and I need to either stretch more or lift the the converse or, you know, all those kinds of things. Yeah. Where am I feeling pain? You know that type of thing, and um, it's very dynamic. But when I started. It was, it was zero dynamicism. It was, <laughs> it was just awkward. like literally, <laughs> could you show me a picture of like what I'm supposed to do? You, you know? know what I love is I'm in the gym and I, <laughs> I've got a little a video that I've sent to myself of some new weightlifting thing or something. And I'm sitting there in the gym and I'm trying to mimic it. And I'm also like this because <laughs> right. I don't have my glasses. And I'm like, well, this is just this is like, a very oh interesting spot to be yeah. in my life. So then I'm like, I need to put it up on the screen so I can right. actually see it, right. which is hilarious. So for those purposes, yeah. you know, if you're learning it, you do you. Like you do you all day long and do what you have to do to learn it. Just know that it is so dynamic and so powerful you don't want to you don't want that the the way that you're learning it to become 
the, the what you're learning, you know, if that makes well, sense. Well, you don't want the way that you learn it to become the way that become you think it exists. Yeah, yeah, because exactly. what happens is if you practice and practice, much like what you were talking about with yoga, yoga is actually a very smooth and seamless, almost unconscious set of movements mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. And that's how you want this to be. You want it to be eventually it's just sort of part of everything exactly. that you do and it's it's easy and that will happen it does simply by practice like nobody ever told me these things about yoga it just happened as soon as i was it's like there's an old saying when the student is ready the teacher will appear and yeah. that that has really guided my whole life um I, I just love that saying and um because i don't think all teachers are are like human you know like i think yeah i think teaching happens when you're ready for it yeah and, and when you're open to learning. And it will happen, just like in yoga or jujitsu or anything else, it'll happen when you're ready for it. Yeah. It'll start to be, you'll be like, oh. And it, a light bulb will go off and you'll be like, this is so dynamic, oh exactly. my gosh. And fractal. And, and fractal and, you'll, and modular. Absolutely, yeah. and you'll start to see the dynamics because you, because you practice in this thing and then you're like, and then you're practicing this other thing and you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> Those things can go together yeah. and they can do twice, 10 times as much when you put them together. See, that's happy mind blown emoji. Yeah. yeah. That that's when you go boom. Yeah. yeah. For it's, sure. It's fantastic. For sure. And we have that. We have people having those experiences on yeah. a daily basis. Yeah. Um, somebody on our team was saying to me uh, uh, last night, she was saying, it's, it's like I'm seeing emotions that I've never seen before. I'm seeing like mm -hmm. all this subconscious stuff that is was right there, but I'm seeing it for the first time. Because she's ready to see it. Be well, because she's practicing. Yeah. And when you practice it, you, you're just seeing more, right? Because yeah. you're seeing you're seeing these things that happen very fast in thinking are almost they're happening so fast you don't see them. Our, our conscious brain doesn't see them. No. When, once you start practicing in a way where you have a language and you have a structure for, for seeing these things, then it's almost like your thinking kind of gets slowed down and pulled apart. Mm. And you're like, oh, oh, that's what I'm doing? <laughs> what, that, really? Oh my God, that's what's causing all these problems in my life? How oh, silly is that? Oh, I just need to fix that and that and blah, blah, blah. It looks like you have one of those ticker tapes, you know, those yeah. tapes, those right. ticker tapes. Well, because it's a lot, it's taking yeah, this moment like in time and it's like, expanding it's it. expanding it. And then, and then you see it so clearly mm -hmm. and you're like, that is, it's hard to believe. That's what I was that thinking. That's what I was thinking. And it's so easy to fix mm -hmm. and I can just fix it. And then it goes away. The problem goes away. Well, I think that we have done what we set out to do here. I yeah. really wanted to make sure because I, I, you know, we were in a couple of different groups last week and that comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to make sure, especially because the last four episodes or a while ago, the longer episodes on DSRMP were actually very well received. And so I was like, I was thinking about it last night. We need to make sure that they understand the dictionary thing mm -hmm. and the bucket thing and the linear thing. And I like the distinction that we've made between these things are very useful as learning tools, mm -hmm. you know, to slow it down and make it stepwise and think about it, you know, in different buckets, but then realize that in real life, they're happening all the time in a nonlinear way, in a dynamical way. Are and, you know, anything? they can keep keep tuning in and and learning things here but we also have uh you know trainings we do that that they can take a in, introductory training and advanced training and well don't forget and those are great because you get like a cohort of people that are working on the same thing yes. and they're practicing mm -hmm. and they're you know and they and they can check in with us and things like that well so, and that's happening inside of the thank you sort of community of yeah. practice yeah. don't forget you can start with a TQ and sort of see where your strengths and weaknesses are across these things. The thinking quotient, yeah. Yeah, sorry, yep. the thinking quotient. And and that, like you said, that really gets you understanding where your weakness is, where your strengths, and what is kind of like the protocol for building on those strengths and, and yeah. shoring up those weaknesses mm -hmm. so that you can be a very adaptive thinker. Because if you think about it, no pun intended, <laughs> you have this dynamic world that we live in 
and you have this very non-dynamical way of thinking that we've been taught. Mm -hmm. And what you need is a dynamical way of thinking to interact with this very dynamical world. Yes. Where situations change and people are changing and everything is changing and everything's dynamical. Everything's interacting with each other. But our thinking as we're taught in school or not even not taught in school in many cases or as we're taught in things like critical thinking and all these other types of thinking it's this very stepwise kind of linear process and um categorical process yeah. and it's just not up to snuff well, to the dynamical world of changing situations and and problems that that we face as humans every day in regular everyday life well and it creates a critical uh mismatch, mismatch. between how you're thinking about stuff and how stuff's happening in the real world which we've yeah. talked a lot about absolutely um all right i think it's time it's time to say it's a wrap. that's a wrap i think that's it that's right. a wrap that's a wrap mm -hmm.